Chapter 73, The Chase. Recco number one was standing in the great meadow. He stared up at the smoking hill of ash and then down at the stampede of footprints around it. There had been a large bonfire with hundreds of animals and one robot. But why? The Recco couldn't make sense of what he was seeing. After thoroughly exploring the site, he continued through the meadow and into the forest. It was around that time that he lost communication with Recco number three, then Recco number two, and he knew that his partners had both been destroyed. Recco number one would have to hunt down the target by himself. The hunter marched on. His blocky head swiveled from side to side, scanning for any sign of Roz. He was soon gazing across the glassy surface of the beaver pond. On the far side, a thread of smoke drifted up from another of those wooden domes. With his powerful legs, the robot launched himself up through the air, soaring in a high, graceful arc over the pond and down to the other side. His heavy feet slammed into the ground, leaving deep craters in the garden by the dome. He hunched over and looked inside, fur and feathers and the dying coals of a fire, but the target wasn't in there. The Recco stood perfectly still and watched as a soft rain started dripping down the tiers of the forest. And then he sensed it. Up in the canopy was something that didn't belong. Roz had been spotted. The hunter watched his target drop from branch to branch down to the forest floor. Then she bounded away through the thickly tangled underbrush without stir stirring a leaf, without snapping a twig, and vanished into the green. However, Recco number one had other means of tracking her. He could sense her electronic signal. The signal was gliding around the edge of the pond, but it was fading fast. A few more seconds and he would lose it entirely. Recco number one burst into a sprint. The forest seemed to sway and quake from his stomping strides. And a minute later, the forest really did begin to move. Trees were toppling down on the Recco. He fired his rifle, and two toppling trees turned to ash. But then, a third swung down through the smoke and hammered his body into the ground. Recco number one shoved the tree aside, pulled himself up, and continued the hunt. He didn't notice the beavers diving back into the pond. Recco number one tore through brambles and leaped over boulders, and suddenly the ground was caving beneath him. Down he fell into a deep crashing against the bottom and twisting his leg. The robot violently pounded his leg back into shape. Then he launched himself up and out of the pit. He didn't notice the groundhogs watching from their tunnels. The hunter faced one trap after another. He was pelted with flaming pine cones and tripped by taut vines and crunched by tumbling rocks. The hunter now limped and rattled and was covered in scars, but he kept going. Roz galloped back and forth across the island, again and again, as she tried to lose Recco number one. But no matter how fast she ran, or how well she hid, or how many animals helped, she couldn't escape the sound of the hunter's stomping footsteps. She had never run so hard for so long, and while her mechanical body was holding up, her wooden foot was not. After hours of relentless pounding, it finally gave out. She was galloping through the rocky forest by the sea cliffs when her foot splintered apart. As soon as Recco number one found the flesh, sorry, found the fresh wooden splinters, he knew his target was in trouble. He stomped out from the trees onto the cliff top and scanned the coastline before, below. Geese were flying down through the drizzle. Otters were wriggling over the rocks. Seaweed and driftwood and broken robot parts were scattered about the shore. But the hunter also sensed a faint electronic signal. Roz was down there somewhere. The hunter's blocky hand clamped onto the cliff top and then whoop! It detached. The hand was connected to a strong cable that spooled out from the end of his arm. He gave the cable two quick tugs and then he stepped off the ledge. Recco number one zipped down the cliffside, one arm releasing cable, the other clutching his rifle and he slowed to a gentle stop just as he reached the ground. Then high above, the robot's hand unclamped and followed the cable all the way down until, whip, it snapped right back onto the end of his arm. He squawked and otter squeaked as Recco number one marched through the robot gravesite. 
The place was littered with torsos and limbs and heads. They were all valuable parts, but he would collect them later. For now, his only concern was finding Rob. He followed the electronic signal over to a clump of seaweed. But where was his target? Was Reco number one sensor malfunctioning? The robot tapped his head a few times, but the mysterious signal remained. He looked around for any other sign of her, and as he did, the clump of seaweed reached up and grasped his rifle. Chapter 74, The Click. Four robot hands were clamped around the rifle. Reco number one loomed above, Roz lay below, camouflaged in seaweed. For, all, for a moment, all was still, and then the hunter suddenly lurched and twisted as he tried to rip the rifle away from his target, but Roz held on. Seaweed fell from her body as she was lifted right off the ground. Her legs dangled in the air until she pounded a foot in a stump against the hunter's broad chest, leaned back, and pulled on the rifle with all her strength. Waves crashed as the robots grappled for the weapon. But Roz was no match for Reco number one. The hunter was too big and too brutal. Roz could feel her body being pulled apart, but she could also feel the rifle being pulled apart. A faint glow appeared between her hands. The glow grew brighter and brighter, and then a blinding explosion launched the robots in opposite directions. When the smoke cleared, shards of the rifle were everywhere. Reco number one's body was pocked with holes and one arm was charred and crippled. Roz's arms and legs had been blown completely off. She was now just a torso and a head. Inside her computer brain, our robot survival instincts were blaring. Her battered body simply could not take any more damage. Clearly, Roz was not designed for combat, but the Reco was. He pulled himself to his feet and hobbled toward his target. Roz wanted to get up and run away, but without arms and legs, our robot couldn't move. She could only speak. Please do not deactivate me, she said. Reco number one ignored her. His blocky hand reached past her face and touched the back of her head. Click. Chapter 75, The Last Rifle. With the target deactivated, Reco number one calmly moved on to the next phase of his mission. He limped through the gravesite and began collecting every single robot part. He splashed into the shallows and returned with a foot. He shook the sand from a cracked torso. He pulled a head out from a tide pool. Each part was then piled around Roz's lifeless body. Brightville watched in horror as his mother slowly disappeared under a pile of parts. Roz looked just like the dead robot, but she wasn't dead. She had simply been shut down. Don't do it, Bright Bill. The flock tried to stop their leader. It's too dangerous. But the goose was determined to bring his poor mother back to life. Bright Bill crouched low to the ground and slowly moved toward the pile of robots. And when Reco number one limped away to collect another part, Bright Bill sprinted over the rocks, pushed past arms and legs, and squeezed into the pile. Click. A muffled voice echoed across the shore. Hello, I am Roz on Unit 7134, but you may call me Roz. Brightville hugged his mother's face as her computer brain rebooted. Mama, wake up! What happened, she said finally. Where is the Reco? He's coming this way. What were you thinking, Brightville? You must leave now before he kills us both. I was scared, Mama, cried the goose. I didn't know what to do. Heavy footsteps stomped toward them. Robot parts were knocked aside, and then Reco number one looked down with his glowing eyes. Brightbill tried to squirm away, but thick fingers locked around him like a cage. Mama, help! cried Brightbill as he was pulled up from the pile. Please do not hurt my son, begged Roz. He is harmless. Reco number one paid no attention to Roz. He just held up the goose in his giant hand, ready to crush the life out of him. Mist swirled in the breeze. Waves sloshed against the rocks. Seagulls circled above. No, not seagulls. Vultures. And one of them clutched something silver in his talons. The vultures spiraled down, and Reco number three's rifle clattered onto the shore. Geese and others quickly surrounded the rifle. They squawked 
and squeaked and fumbled with the weapon, trying to aim the clunky thing. The hunter was confused. How had those animals gotten a rifle? And could they possibly know how to fire it? They did know. The geese had seen a trigger pressed before. A beam of light briefly flashed through the gloom. At first, it seemed as if nothing had happened. But a moment later, record number one's chest began glowing a brilliant orange, and then it was melting and oozing down his front. And soon there was a wide, gaping hole in the middle of his torso. His hand suddenly unclenched, and bright bulk fluttered away. Sea water sprayed over the grave site, and steam hissed up from the reco's scorching hot guts. He shook and twitched and collapsed beside Roz. Reco number one turned his face to Roz and spoke in a quiet, garbled voice. More Reco's will come for you, and if you d -d -d destroy them, still more will come. The m -m -m acres will not rest until all missing robots have b -b been retrieved. When? When will they come? said Roz. How long do we have? You can still be fixed, Roz. Go to the airship. Bring all of the robot parts with you. The ship knows what to do. His voice went silent. His eyes went dark. Reco number one was dead.